Praise the Lord, Point Church family. Thank you for tuning in today for our Decisions and Direction, Part 3. We're so thankful that you joined today. Before we dive into our lesson, I just want to make a few announcements regarding this week. This Friday, there's a youth service, so see Brother Matthew Richardson about the details about that event. And then this Sunday, after our breakfast and our service, after service, we're having a grad day celebration. We celebrate with all our graduates. We're so thankful about this new season in your life, and we want to celebrate with you. So see Sister Chelsea or Sister Michelle regarding uh, those event, that event. And then this summer, we've got a great summer lined up for you here at The Point. We're going to be talking a little bit about it this Sunday, giving you some dates, revival services that we're going to do. And you know, we just want you to be a part. We know that perhaps you're going to have a summer sila, still some time away with your family. That's great. We encourage that. But uh, we do want to get you the summer schedule. We've got some unique and exciting things happening here at The Point. All right, well, let's dive right into today's lesson. We're talking about decisions and directions. The Bible does tell us that God isn't the author of confusion. So decisions that you have to make that oftentimes can be confusing, uh, God wants to be involved because he's not authoring that confusion. And we're all having to make decisions about our careers, you may be a young adult taking the next step in your life, uh, just leading a family, having children, or being in a relationship. I believe that these lessons can help you in all areas of your life. God is wanting you and I to make clear, sound directions so we can glean from His Word principles that will help us when we're trying to make good decisions or when we're forced with serious decisions that we have to make. The scripture that we have been using has been in Proverbs 22 verse 3. It's kind of been the worldview scripture. But Proverbs 22 3 tells us this. A prudent and far-sighted person sees the evil of sin and hides himself from it. But the naive continue on and are punished by suffering the consequences of sin. So the wise man Solomon is telling us that the decisions that we make, we have to be able to look beyond today and see tomorrow. That we shouldn't be naive and continue on in our bad habits, our bad decisions that lead to these habits. That God wants you and I to make, as I've been saying, good and right decisions. Um, we talked about it, we've been saying it, that oftentimes other people are impacted by our decisions. Nobody makes a decision in a bubble. Nobody makes a decision uh, isolated. The decisions that you and I make do have an impact on others. Even the flip side of that is true, that regrets that I have for decisions that I didn't make or decisions that were wrong and now I have to backtrack in life. Others are also impacted by that decision. Well, what, what's the key here? Well, uh, before we go into another key, uh, we've talked about wisdom, having wisdom, and wisdom is incorporating wise counsel, it's taking note of the influences uh, of my life, looking at what the Word of God has to say when I'm making decisions, the Bi and then honesty. But the Bible also talks to us about being sober. So I'm going to use an example, but stay with it for a moment. Think about bad decision making. Uh, the opposite of sobriety, of course, would be intoxicated. To be intoxicated naturally, to be under the influence of some chemical substance, is going to lead to bad decision making. They tell us, scientists tell us, and doctors tell us that when someone is intoxicated, the prefrontal cortex or the part of us that thinks and can connect the dots and feel and, and make rational decisions, well, that is muddled, that is clouded, and oftentimes intoxication will lead to bad decision making. Well, if you look at that example in a spiritual context, listen to what Peter tells us. 
Peter tells us about a different intoxication. Not a natural intoxication, um, but a intoxication, the culture around us. 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us this, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Peter very intentionally writes to you and I that sobriety, spiritual sobriety, will lead to sound spiritual decisions. He's telling us, do not be intoxicated. Don't be intoxicated uh, by the things around us, meaning the culture around us. What society tells us that we need to have in order to be happy and successful and to live a meaningful life. But that we would be spiritually sober and let the Spirit of God lead our lives and direct our decisions. Ephesians 5.18, Paul writes to us and tells us, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So Paul is also writing to us about this idea of sobriety, talking about a natural principle, but using a natural principle about abstaining from alcohol and telling us, don't fill your life up with things that intoxicate you. If you're going to be intoxicated, be intoxicated by the Spirit of God. Because the Spirit of God is going to lead you and I, guide you and I, the Word of God tells us, into all truth. So decisions that I have to make about my career, decisions that I may have to make about how to raise my children and be a better husband or a better wife or uh, decisions that may impact my future. Paul even tells us, don't be intoxicated or if you're going to be intoxicated, be intoxicated by the Spirit. Why? Well, again, sound Spiritual decisions are the byproduct of a life filled with the Spirit. Now, let's look at, uh, so how does this work? Actually, let's, let's kind of take a practical approach here. How does, this, how does this work for our everyday life? Okay, Paul, Peter, we're going to be alert. We're not going to be intoxicated by the culture. We're not going to be intoxicated by negative influences. Well, I believe that the Spirit of God works in our lives. We see it. It works in our lives in a unique way. If you could think back to the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost when they heard this convicting message by Peter that they had crucified the Lord of glory. The Bible says that they were pricked in their heart. That is the Spirit working on the spirit man. It's just a gentle nudge. It's just a little discomfort. The Holy Ghost isn't ever going to put you in a headlock and demand things of you. It's a gentle nudge of the Spirit. So, the Spirit of God serves as a guide. It's not going to govern our lives unless we allow the Spirit of God to govern our lives. So, here's a point that I want you to uh, uh, take with you tonight. Pay attention to the tension. Pay attention to the tension. 1 John 2.27, let me give you a scripture here. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as the anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it is taught you, remain in him. John is writing, pay attention to that still small voice, that little tension that you feel in your spirit when you're forced with the decision to make and you feel that little discomfort, you feel a little uneasy. That is the spirit of God working in your life. Pay attention to that. Oftentimes, we suppress that feeling. We don't like the tension, and so we force decisions. And forced decisions are going to be wrong decisions. We have the Spirit of God to govern us, to guide us. God's not going to do this by force. He's going to do this by choice. 
But he, his spirit is going to be it, it, or is in us. And it, it gives us that little rub. It's the rub against the fleshly man that wants to do his will. That wants to have his way and wants to be able to determine the outcome of his decisions. Well, if you're making a decision and you feel bothered by that, stay bothered by what's bothering you. Stay in that. Explore that feeling. Let God show you where it may be your will and not his will. If it's going against the grain of the spirit, it's going to feel like tension. Again, most disappointments come from decisions that are made prematurely in haste or quickly or when you're not paying attention to that still small voice that's trying to lead you in the right choice. Wise decisions, the right decision should be clearly thought out. It should be prayed about. And if it's big enough, it should be fasted about. And definitely you should seek wise counsel. Decisions should not be made because we're feeling nostalgic. Because we're trying to recapture something that we feel that we lost. That is the definition of hopelessness. True hopelessness is to look back at the past and want events of the past to change. Or to stew enough in your past that you try to recapture something that you think you should have had back then and try to bring it into today. People make nostalgic decisions, try to think about the good old days and the way life used to be. That's going to lead to bad decision making. Um, being bored. We live in a society that constantly needs to be entertained and that culture sometimes intoxicates us that, that we, we need to have the latest, we need to have the greatest, we need to have today what it took our parents and our grandparents a lifetime to build. Think about that. That's, that's the influence of culture. There used to be a wise man, a wise preacher. He signed one of my Bibles about 30 years ago. His name was I.H. Terry. And he used to tell the young men this. It takes a long time to build the fence. It takes a long time to build things. And if you're bored because uh, you're not being entertained enough in your life and you're done with this thing and so you need something else, you're going to be a bad decision maker. If you're frustrated, if you're confused, if you're feeling lonely or discouraged, all of these feelings are sure to leave you with a bag full of regret. You're not going to get, I'm not going to receive the outcome that I want. So, decisions that are right are rooted in the Word of God. If they're wrong, God's going to leave a little tension in your spirit. Pay attention to the tension. Let me let me real quickly just uh, use an example with the life of David. Uh, we understand David comes to us as a shepherd boy in the scripture. That's what we first know of him. You know the story, but just quick recap. The prophet Samuel shows up to his father's house, tells uh, Jesse that one of his sons is going to be crowned king of Israel. Of course, that son happens to be David. David, of course, steps onto the scene of history and cements his place in history by defeating the giant Goliath for the glory of God and for the help of his people. Well, after that, Saul's heart is hardened and he begins to, in a fit of jealousy and rage, begins to chase David all over the land of Israel in hopes to vanquish this would-be king. David's running for his life. He's confused. He has the word of God that one day he's going to be king, but he's running for his life. Well, David, this rags to riches, and again, rags to rags in this part of the story, is running with about 300 men, seeking uh, just reprieve from Saul. One day, the Bible says, well, Saul is seeking out David. That David spots Saul off from a distance. And rather than confronting the army of Saul, where for sure they would have been routed, the 300 men, David goes and hides in a cave and is going to let Saul pass by. It seems like an easy 
win for David until Saul has to use the restroom. Saul mounts off the donkey. He goes into a cave where exactly David and his men, the Bible tells us, are hiding out. Saul goes to the front of that cave, faces outward. David's men retreat further into the cave, but enough to be able to see Saul. And there he is in a vulnerable position, easy for David to take his head off. Listen to what 1 Samuel 24.4 tells us. The word of God tells us this. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Wow. Think about that. I'm going to read that again. Think about this scenario. There it is. This is the pathway for David to be king. As a matter of fact, the men that were with him knew of the word of God prophesied to David. Not only that David would be king, but that David that David's enemies would be vanquished by God and allowing a clear pathway to the throne of Israel. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give you your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. There it is. David in front of him has what all of us are looking for in our lives when we're making decisions. The right opportunity. We even talk about it naturally. The world around us talks about it. Looking for the right door of opportunity to open up. And here it is. Here's the scenario. Here's how it's going to happen. The right opportunity presents itself to you, David. Listen to what David does, though. In 1 Samuel 24, 5. Afterward, here's the word of God. There's the scenario. It looks like the right decision. It looks like this is going to be the pathway to uh, where God destined me to be. Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. David crawls enough, takes a piece of, of Saul's garment, cuts it off, and he's guilty stricken. He, he, there's some tension I could imagine David crawling in what we know as a military crawl with all the stealth, with all the maneuvering, with all the subtlety, thinking here it is. But David paid attention to the tension. David understood all of us are guaranteed opportunities, but what we're not guaranteed is outcomes. This may be the right opportunity, but is this the path that God chose for me? To get to the throne that he has for me? Is this what I'm going to tell my grandkids when they ask me how I got on the throne of Israel? The tension leading David. He was conscience stricken. He paid attention to the tension. I'm going to be king one day, but this is not the path to the king, the kingdom. I'm going to sit on the throne one day, but even though this looks like an opportunity, I'm not going to use this opportunity and get it confused with how God really wants me to be on the throne. God didn't tell David like he doesn't tell us. But God didn't tell David seven chapters later, the Philistines are going to take care of Saul for you. No, all David had to go by was the tension, the bothering in his spirit. And when you feel that, and when I feel that, it's God trying to speak to you. This may not be right. This may not be what I have for you. Here's the hard part sometimes of life is you will sometimes have direction. But don't confuse the direction of God with the timing of God. You may have a word from God and I hope you do. And, and if you don't, spend time enough with God to get you a word that God wants to give to you about your purpose and your destiny and what he's called all of us to do and you specifically to do. Pay, spend some time with all of that. But when you do get direction from God, God forbid you would confuse direction with timing. David had direction from God, but it wasn't the right time. 
It was in his timing. And he paid attention to that conscience, the Bible tells us. The working in his mind. Listen to what, uh, or before I say this, listen to what David does. David refuses to play God in his life or in Saul's life. I refuse to try to force an outcome that I want. This looks like an opportunity, but David says, I'm not going to play God and try to determine the outcome that I want. I refuse to play God in my life or in Saul's life. David left the outcome to be king in God's hands. However you're going to do it, I know this is not how you're going to do it, God, because my conscience is telling me, don't do it, don't do it. It's not the right time. You may have direction, you may have a word, but you may not have the right time. And all you're going to do is waste time. All I'm going to do is lose time when I make the wrong decisions. So, David knew this wasn't how God determined it to be. Look at what Samuel uh, writes, 1 Samuel 24, 12. You go further down. Listen to what verse 12 says. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. What do you have your hands in today? Think about a decision that you're having to make. Think about a decision you may have already made. Maybe your hand's too much into it. Maybe you, maybe I sometimes try to force things because I have some sort of direction. David said, I'm leaving it in God's hands. I'm leaving the timing and the outcome in God's hands. <laughs> David decided to put his future in God's hands. If you go back and read 1 Samuel 24, you go further down. The Bible says that Samuel, or excuse me, Saul was humiliated by David. Saul was humiliated by David's humility. He wasn't humiliated because he got outmaneuvered, outflanked, out, out strategized. Be, he was humiliated by the humility that David had. Because every other man other than David would have taken his head off. As a matter of fact, it highlighted what Saul was doing wrong by he wouldn't have given he wouldn't have given David that opportunity. He wouldn't have given David that pass. He was seeking to kill David. But he was humiliated by a humble man. And a humble man lets God determine the direction and the timing and the outcome of all his decisions. David, a great principle that we learned, David wasn't going to let Saul's bad behavior to determine a bad decision for him. We, we have had, you have had bad things happen to you. But don't let others' bad behavior affect your ability to make the right decision. And sometimes the right thing is the hardest thing to do. But it's always the right thing to do. Don't let others' bad behavior affect your ability to make a wise and good and godly decision. God never tells us the timing or the outcomes. He asks you and I to have faith and to trust Him as our great shepherd so that we could have total confidence in His ability to lead our lives. I think God can lead my life better than Michael Gonzalez can lead his life. So, that's part three of Decisions and Directions. I hope it blessed you. I hope with the help of God, all of us will take these principles over these three lessons that we have heard and learn to apply them in our lives. There's nothing wrong with backtracking. There's nothing wrong with stopping and saying, you know what, I may have been on the wrong course. I may need to explore what, what is going on around me. Maybe this isn't the right career path. Maybe this isn't the right direction. Maybe whatever it is, pay attention to the tension. Thank you so much for listening today. Again, I pray that the Word of God enriches your lives. We've got a great weekend ahead of us. 
let's celebrate and congratulate all our graduates this Sunday after our morning service. God bless you. We'll see you on Sunday.